Good morning everyone, my name is Renee and I'm the Kids and Families Minister here at Blacktown Anglican Church. Whether you join us regularly or this is your first week with us, we're so glad that you've tuned in today and we hope that you're encouraged by all we do. This is the last week in our Jesus Shaped Living series and Luke will be speaking to us from the final two verses of James chapter 5. We'll spend some time in prayer together and I have a challenge for the young people of our church. But before we do all that, let's start our morning by singing praise to God through the words of our first song, Yet Not I.
During one of our Zoom morning teas, that song was voted our favourite overall amongst the songs that we sing during church online. It's definitely one of my favourites, and while there have been times this week I have felt tired and overwhelmed, the words to this song remind me, The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Saviour he will stay. I labour on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. Even in our weakness, God's power is displayed, and we can be thankful for that. We can be thankful for many things, and so we're going to spend a moment to say the prayer of thanksgiving together that will come up on the screen. Gracious God, we humbly thank you for all your gifts so freely given to us, for life and health and safety, for power to work, leisure to rest, and for all that is beautiful in creation and human life. But above all, we praise you for your Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for the gift of your spirit, and for the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. There's another song that I often sing to myself as a reminder to remember the Lord. And I have a challenge for the young people of our church and those of you who consider yourselves to be young as well. I challenge you to make some actions up to the words of this song that we're gonna watch for the kids spot today. When we come back to church in just three weeks time, we'll do this song during creche and kids church and we'll put all the actions together. If you're not coming back to church for a little while, but you still wanna do the challenge, you can send me a video and we'll make sure to watch it and add the actions that you give us. Anyone that can make up an action for the whole song will win a prize. If you want to practice, you can find this song on YouTube and Spotify. How about we watch Colin sing it and good luck. Colin, look out for that tree stump. Oh, 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 oh. who put that there? Ow, oh, ow, oh, ow. Oh. Oh, I stubbed my toe. Uh, it's actually acting. <laughs> if you stub your toe when you get out of bed and you slip in the shower and you knock your head, if you miss your brekkie and your bike tires flat, the dog eats your lunch and you step on the cat, what do you do? Remember the Lord, oh, remember that he is in control. Remember the Lord, oh, he's watching his children, he cares, oh, remember the Lord, oh, oh, all right, um, now let me see, ah yes, all right, try this. If you get to school about a half hour late and the principal meets you at the gate. If you can't remember one plus two and you busted for something that you didn't do. I didn't do it, what do you do? Remember the Lord, oh, remember that he is in control. Remember the Lord, you go, oh, what's he doing? He's watching his children. He cares, oh, remember the Lord, oh, oh. All right, you get home and, ah, I have to sit down for this one. Your dad is crusty, your mum's in a flap, and you spill the custard in your sister's lap. If you're sent to bed, you don't know why, you can't get to sleep, you just want to cry, you want to cry. More acting. What do you do? Remember the Lord, oh, remember that he is in control. Remember the Lord, you go, oh, what's he doing? He's watching his children, he cares, oh, remember the Lord, oh, oh. All right, this is the sad part. <laughs> All right. If you're hitting the skids and you're up the creek, if you're down and out and things look bleak, if you're in the pits and you're out for a duck, long in the tooth and short of a buck, what do you do? You sing it. Re 
Remember the Lord. Oh, remember that He is in control. Remember the Lord. You go, oh, what's He doing? He's watching His children and He cares. Oh, remember the Lord. Oh, oh, I'm going back up here now. See you soon. Oh, there's a stump. I hope I don't. Ow! Oh! <laughs> I'm climbing on it. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> did you see what I just did? I stubbed my toe and I got out of bed and I slipped in the shower and I knocked my head. Oh, oh dear. But I'll remember the Lord. Oh, remember that He is in control. Come on, remember the Lord. Oh, what's he doing? He's watching his children and he cares. Oh, remember the Lord. Oh, oh, da 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 Friends, let's pray. We praise you, O Lord, for your power and your majesty. All that is in the heavens and earth is yours, created through Christ and for his glory. And every good gift we enjoy is from your hand. We thank and praise you that nothing in creation is outside of your control and nothing is hidden from your sight. Help us to trust that you are right and true and good in every measure. Allow us to rest in your knowledge and wisdom and love. We praise you as King over all the earth, and in your power, your promises are trustworthy. And we thank you that you promise a day when peace will reign forevermore, and all creation will honour you as the mighty and sovereign ruler. Merciful Lord, you alone can order our affections and desires. So please teach us to love what you command and teach us to desire what you promise. Shape our hearts with a deep love for you, a passion for others to know of your grace and your love. We praise you as Lord over all the nations and peoples of this world. Help us see every human being as a creature made in your image and likeness. Help us to love our brothers and sisters, our neighbours, and our enemies with a Christ-like love. And give us a joy in seeing your light and truth go out to every corner of the world. And a joy to see the hearts that long to see those from every tribe and people and culture and language recognize Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Father, we live in a world that is constantly changing. Please calm our fears and anxieties. Help us to be gracious, patient and kind to one another in this difficult season. We thank you for our medical practitioners who are working on the front lines to save lives here in Australia and around the world. Please keep them safe. Give them the rest they need to serve people well. We pray for those seeking a cure to this virus. We thank you for their intellect and wisdom. And we pray a cure may be speedily found. We pray for those who have suffered the loss of loved ones or sickness, that you will comfort them. Father, please give peace to all people suffering with fear, anxiety and stress at this time. Comfort those who are sick, have lost loved ones or who are facing financial, mental or social challenges. We especially pray this week for the family and friends of Mari Dunn after her passing last Sunday and for Nigel Pounder and his family on the passing of his mother. We pray too for Lorraine Stanley, Judy Alsop, and Paul Newman with their various health needs. We pray for students preparing to sit HSC exams in the coming weeks, and especially for Rowan Hagen, Ashlyn Phillip, and Hannah Branson. Father, we pray for nations and governments across our globe, for our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, our Premier, Gladys Berejiklian, our Mayor Tony Bleasdale, and all who serve in government across our land. 
Please grant their decisions may be based on wise counsel, so that peace and welfare, truth and justice may prevail among us. Guide our nation to provide and care for all people, just as you have done for us through Jesus. Father, comfort and sustain us, we pray, through your Son, Jesus. Amen. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Are you one of those people who struggles to end a conversation? Uh, sometimes I find myself saying goodbye in like 10 different ways at the end of a phone call. It's a, bye, thanks, nice to talk to you, chat to you later, see ya, have a good day, you too, all right, bye. Uh, sometimes I feel like I, I want to get that last goodbye in on the conversation. Uh, not because I want the last word, but because I don't want the other person to feel like I didn't care about them. Well, today we come to the end of the letter of James after 15 weeks reading this together. And it's very clear James doesn't have the same problem of ending a conversation that I do. In fact, he, he doesn't even say goodbye at all, as you might have noticed in the Bible reading. Uh, throughout this letter, James has been warning his readers uh, about ensuring that their, their actions match their beliefs. And again and again, he's cautioned us to see that what we say, what we do, well, that that is in agreement with what we believe. James has warned us that if our actions don't match our faith, well, then our faith is worthless. Let me remind you from a few verses we've already looked at. In 26, James says, If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Or in 2.17, he says, Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Again in 4.17, Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. And time and again, James has been calling us to uh, what we, we call Jesus-shaped living. Now, a, a life where our actions match what we say we believe to be true about Jesus. And now in these last couple of verses here, right at the end, as James concludes his letter, well, you, you might expect him to, well, finish with a few personal greetings, to say goodbye, as Paul often does in his letters and list a few people by name. But James's letter is not really that kind of letter. If you remember back to the beginning of chapter 1, James said he is writing to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. Now that means predominantly Jewish Christians who have been scattered all around the world. And this is a letter from James, who is one of the key Christian leaders of his day, to well, to the leaders of the global church at the time, to churches across the world, to Christians scattered everywhere. So what does James want to say to finish this letter to Christians across the world? Well, let me put it this way. Jesus-shaped people seek more Jesus-shaped people. Jesus-shaped people seek more Jesus-shaped people. In these verses, James is reminding us to live out our faith in the ways that he has outlined already before in this book. Be people whose actions match our faith. Uh, but more than that, to be people who are helping others do this as well. It's not enough to seek to be a Jesus-shaped person. Part of living that out is to help others to do the same. Jesus-shaped people seek more Jesus-shaped people. Of course, it would be no surprise to hear James talk about the importance of telling others about Jesus. Uh, but he's got something a bit more specific in mind when we look just here. Take a look with me at verse 19. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, 
Uh, James is particularly speaking of people who identify as Christians and they've been part of the Christian community, they've been part of a church, and they have somehow lost their way. So why does James focus on this particular group of people? Well, it's because being a Christian is not just about you belonging to God. It's about belonging to God's family. That's why he starts this verse addressing them as brothers, or, and we would say brothers and sisters. It's, it's all of God's people. It's a reminder that we are all part of God's family, that we have a responsibility toward one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Now, this can be a bit of a culture shock if, well, if like me, you've grown up in a Western culture. In places like Australia here, we are taught that faith is a deeply private and personal thing. You know, we have these unwritten social rules in society. You know, at a dinner party, you should never talk about politics or religion. Anyone of faith in any significant leadership role in our country, and especially so in politics, well, they're encouraged to keep their faith private, to not let it shape their work or to show it in any real way. Perhaps in your workplace, there might be rules about how you can speak about religion or not. And at the very least, it's certainly a taboo subject to speak of in our culture. And if, like me, you have grown up in a Western culture, then let me say we've got much to learn from our brothers and sisters from other cultures, where community and belonging are, are much stronger cultural norms than the private, individualised lives of Australians. The culture shock for us comes because we tend to push back against those kinds of things. Our, our tendency is to be individual, isolated Christians whose faith is a private matter between me and God. And James pushes strongly on us back at that. See, there are, there are no Christian orphans. Faith is not a private issue. And if you attempt to follow Jesus without Christian community, or without a commitment and a partnership with your brothers and sisters in Christ, well, I'd like to say that you're missing out. But the truth is, it's so much more than that. You are missing out, but you are also going against one of the fundamental ways that God has designed life with Jesus to be. In Jesus-shaped community, to be lived with the family of God. And James's final instructions in his letter make that very clear for us. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. That's worth noting here that when James talks about a sinner and bringing them back, he's not talking about just anyone who sins. I mean, that's everyone. He's talking about a specific group of people who identify as Christian, but refuse to submit to God's way. It's those Christians who don't care about taming their tongue. But those Christians who have no desire to do good works that God has called them to do. It's those Christians who express arrogance in their riches or, or boasting in their selfish plans. This is about people who call themselves Christian and yet they refuse to submit to God's way of life. James is kind of describing a bit of a hypothetical situation here where a, a person identifies as a Christian but they refuse to submit to God's way of living. They, they wander away from God and from the life that God has called them to this is someone who, who accepts Jesus as Saviour, but has a much harder time accepting him as their king. So what does James encourage us to do in such a situation? Bring them back. Now, I don't want to overstate that the, their salvation depends on you. But what James is telling us is that it is so important for us to support our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not an optional job that we have. 
It's a really core part of what it means to be a Christian. It would be like, imagine trying to make a pizza, but without anything at all in the form of a pizza base. I mean, you don't have a pizza, do you? You, you have a plate of cheesy meat and vegetables. Trying to make a pizza without a base, well, it, it's just as impossible as trying to live as a Christian on your own. You are missing something so fundamental to what God has called you to. Jesus-shaped people seek more Jesus-shaped people. One of the blessings of being in a Jesus-shaped community is precisely that you are not alone. That when life is a struggle, and for many of us this year has been a great struggle, that there are people around you who know you, who love you, who care for you, who point you back to the Word of God. That when you wrestle with your faith, when you feel uncertain, there are people who love you and care for you and walk with you. And it also means that when, when there are other people struggling in their faith, that you are there to love them, to care for them and to walk with them. We need each other because this is how God designed us to live. He designed us for community. He designed us for relationships with one another. He didn't make us Facebook friends. He made us brothers and sisters. Jesus-shaped people seek more Jesus-shaped people. If we have someone at church who is going through a bit of a crisis in their faith, whose responsibility is it to care for them? If we have someone who is kind of drifting away from their faith and drifting away from church, whose responsibility is it to follow them up and walk with them? If we had people gossiping about others or being selfish or even seeking to take advantage of others, who should do something about that? If we had someone engaged in a, a terrible sin that needed confronting, then well, who should do it? Uh, traditionally, we might first think, well, that's the minister's job, isn't it? I'd better tell Luke so he can do something about it. Brothers and sisters, the truth is that it is no less your job than mine. It is no less your job than mine. We have the same responsibility in this. Now, yes, I am the leader of our church in my particular role, and perhaps I should know more of what is going on and maybe even be included where that's helpful. Sure. But James's words here are to all Christians. We are to all have the responsibility to help one another, to bring each other back to the truth. Now, centuries ago in the Middle Ages, uh, people, especially the rich, uh, they would pay the ministers and the bishops to pray on their behalf. They didn't just ask for some prayer. They paid them to pray on their behalf, it, like outsourcing your prayer life. You paid someone to do it so that you didn't have to. But it's, it's a bit strange, really. Can you imagine paying someone to complete a uni degree on your behalf? You, know, you pay someone to take the classes for you, pay them to sit the exams and write the, the essays and complete the assignments. At the end of the day, you, you don't really have the degree. They do. You can't outsource your own education. And you can't outsource your own spiritual growth either. We, we don't pay our ministers to do ministry for us. And if I let that happen, well, I would be robbing you of the, the life that God's designed for you. Now, when you see someone wander from the truth, you're certainly allowed to come and talk to me. Please do. But it is no more my responsibility than it is yours to help that person, to seek them out, to encourage them to grow as a Jesus-shaped person. In many ways, my job is to oversee the, the entire health of our church, to ensure we have good systems and structures in place that enable as many as possible to grow and flourish in our church at whatever stage they are at. 
My first priority is not to care for every single person who is struggling in their faith. I mean, how could I? There's way too many people for one person to do that. Now, my role is to ensure that we are growing more people with the conviction and the skills to do this together. Because, friends, this is all of our responsibility. My job is to ensure that we are growing a Jesus-shaped community of, well, Jesus-shaped people. And that we are seeking more Jesus-shaped people together. Now, maybe today someone has come to mind for you and you know uh, they might be in a place of wandering. Someone who you think you should reach out to. Uh, Let me offer one caution to all of this. Here's my caution. Don't treat people as projects. Don't treat people as projects. Friends, we care for people. People are not projects to complete. They are not puzzles to solve. If you don't genuinely care for someone, then you will be severely hindered in your ability to point them to Jesus. If you want to engage with someone who is wandering in their faith, let me give you two really important truths that you will want to make clear. Firstly, you, you will say, I want you to return to Jesus. I want you to come back to Jesus. And secondly, be clear, it is not a requirement for our continued friendship. You want to talk about Jesus. You you want to show that you care about their spirituality, their spiritual life, their place with God. And you want to put that on the table and be clear. It'll probably be awkward, but it will help. And you also want to be clear that you are not putting a condition on the friendship. But we don't write people off like that. I care about your walk with Jesus and I will be here no matter where you are at with that. Now you can find your own words, but anything less and you'll make people feel unloved and used. Don't treat people as projects. All right, that's the end of the caution. Now, some of you are listening today and you do what James is telling us here so, so well. Uh, You have a deep love for your brothers and sisters. You have reached out to people who are wandering. You have seen great joy in some returning. And maybe you've seen others reject you and walk away. I find it really hard for me to share some of my personal experiences on this. But let me just say... I. I've lost some really dear friendships as I've tried to do this. And it is heartbreaking. And I've also seen some amazing things happen where they made some really strong friendships through some initially really awkward conversations. And some of you know what that is like. And if that is you, brothers and sisters, keep it up. Persevere because you are, James says, saving their soul from death and covering a multitude of sins. Now, that doesn't mean that you're the one saving them. Don't get confused. You're not Jesus, okay? But it means you have pointed them back to the grace of Jesus. And friends, praise God that he would work in and through us to do that work, that through you he might bring someone from death to life. Amen. Now, there will be others listening today who... Well, maybe you feel a bit more distant from that kind of Jesus-shaped living. You feel a bit distant from what James is talking about here. It's not very familiar for you. Maybe you're not feeling particularly connected in a Jesus-shaped community. And I'm not, I'm talking more about just COVID. I mean, this has been obviously difficult for all this. But maybe you've been in a church, maybe it's ours, maybe it's another one, and You've just kind of been around without really engaging, without really committing, and without expressing yourself as a member of God's family. Can I say, here's the thing. It is never too late to start. You won't be able to do what James says here if you don't know people, if you don't invest in community, if you aren't committed to the family of God. So let me encourage you, start there. Pick a few people you want to get to know. 
invite someone around for lunch or for a coffee. Join a community group, which is especially the kind of place where we want to see this happening, where you have a deep sense of being brothers and sisters in Christ, where you are knowing people and being known by them, where you walk together in pursuit of Jesus. Because Jesus-shaped people seek more Jesus-shaped people. Lastly, I hope there are some still listening who, well, maybe you feel like you are the wandering soul that James is talking about. You feel lost. Maybe you feel a bit guilty about it. That you, you don't know if there's an easy way back or what the path is. Maybe you feel like a wandering soul your whole life. Now, I, I think I've said some important things today, but here is the most important thing you will hear me say today. These verses highlight God's mercy for you. The mercy that is available to the wandering soul. Friends, you can be forgiven. I mean, James wouldn't tell a Christian brother or sister to seek out the wandering soul if they were a lost cause. No, you are never too lost. Some of you I know have found this year amidst all of the challenges of COVID and lockdowns and all kinds of things. Some of you have grown much closer to God. You felt way more dependent on him and you've spent so much more time with him. And it's been a great blessing. And I'm so thankful that's true for some of you. But for, for others, perhaps many I know, well, you found this, this is a really difficult year for your faith. It's been really difficult to live it out the stress and uncertainty of life, the, the lack of being able to meet together physically has meant, well, it's kind of felt like a year of wandering for you. Perhaps it's felt like you've taken a couple of steps backwards even. But rest assured, God has not stepped back from you. He hasn't. James reminds us here in, in these last verses there is wonderful mercy and grace on offer for all of us. Even if we have wandered away somewhat or a far way. Even if we have felt completely disconnected from God, from church, from prayer. God is right there waiting to welcome you with open arms. So if that's you, come back to Jesus. Come and discover the, the wonderful hope and mercy and grace and forgiveness and kindness that he has for you. Come back to Jesus and find salvation for your soul. That you will save your soul from death. That you will have your sins, multitude as they may be, they will be covered by Jesus. Friends, come back to Jesus. He is waiting with open arms to show you the mercy and kindness that he's shown all of us through his death and resurrection. And if that's you right now, you're feeling that, you want to talk to someone, please get in touch. We'd love to chat through that with you to help you in any way we can. Uh, you can let us know on a, on a welcome card or whatever it might be. I'm going to pray that God might continue to work in and through all of us, wherever we are at, that we might continue to pursue a Jesus-shaped life together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the letter of James. Thank you for his faithfulness as a, uh, a leader in the church in his day. Thank you for this letter that he's written for us to read together and uh, to be confronted and challenged and comforted by it at various points over these weeks. Father, we thank you for the great blessing of being part of your church community, your family. Father, help us to grow as a Jesus-shaped community here at Blacktown Anglican. Help us to be people who are becoming more and more like Jesus ourselves and that we are people who are seeking others to be Jesus-shaped people as well. Help us to connect, to build community, to grow in our love for one another that we might proclaim together the wonderful grace and mercy and kindness Jesus has for all of us. Amen.
Friends, some really exciting news. Uh, I'm, I hope you're well aware already. We are just a couple of weeks away from resuming our physical gatherings in the building. It'd be so wonderful to see faces in person again. 1st of November, 9.15 a.m. is gonna be our first service and we're really looking forward to that. Thank you so much to the many of you who have already submitted uh, a survey to let us know 
uh, whether you're intending on coming uh, to our services again once they resume and how you might be able to serve us. If you haven't yet responded, please do so. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, please get in touch so we can let you know some more details. Uh, it probably just means we don't have your contact details. So if you get in touch with us and, and we have those, then we can uh, keep you informed as well. I want to let you know the next two weeks uh, are going to be a little bit different from what we've been doing the last six months, really. Next week will be, for most of us, our last regular church online service. Uh, we're going to be hosting this as we have each week, uh, normal experience for you. Uh, while Church Online is happening next week, we, we've invited a small number of people to come and help us trial a bit of a preview service. So we're, we're, we're reminded we're getting close, it's getting exciting, we're getting everything together. So we're inviting a small number next week who'll be here as we run a preview service and we're going to record that service. And so on the following week, on the 25th of October, instead of our normal Church Online service as you've seen this morning, uh, on the 25th you will get to watch that preview service. So we'll record it and we'll be showing it for you so you get a chance to see what church will look like in November going forward. Um, it'll be more or less the experience you'll have watching our live stream at home once we begin that on the 1st of November. And for those of you who will be joining us in person, you'll get a sense of what it's going to feel like to be in the room uh, and to, to navigate some of the the tricky challenges there, but also some of the real joys of being able to get together physically. So that's the next two weeks. Um, uh, we're going to be, uh, Church Online is our last regular week next week. The week after we'll be watching uh, at home still our preview service so you get a sense of it. And then I look forward to seeing you in person finally on the 1st of November. Look forward to seeing you then. Over the last 15 weeks, we have been challenged and encouraged by the words of James to be people who lived Jesus-shaped lives. Has there been something that's challenged you in particular or encouraged you in your walk with Jesus? Or maybe you still have questions. We'd love to hear about it. And you can get in touch with us by filling in an online welcome card that you'll find in the description. If you have any prayer requests or you just want to say hi, you can send us a welcome card as well. So we've just finished our series in James, and so we'd like you to join us next week as we start a new series called Love in Little Letters, where we'll be looking at the book of Philemon and 2 John. Now with church relaunching in just three weeks time, we have our second last virtual morning tea Zoom session today. We'll be taking a break next week and then return for our final party morning tea Zoom on the 25th. You can find the Zoom code for today on the screen. That comes to the end of Church Online for today, but let me pray for us as we close. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us through sending your Son to die in our place, defeat death and rise again, so that those who trust in you can live in relationship with you. Be with each of us this week and continue to remind us of your great love for all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. See you next week.